Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you David Niven in John Balderston's Barclay Square on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present the kind of story which I must confess I'm rather fond of. One that not only enchants you during its telling, but leaves you something to think about and even to wonder about. This story is Barclay Square, John Balderston's charming play which has fascinated millions of theatre-goers all over the world. I suppose at one time or another, every one of us has teased himself with the problem of time. What time is, and the strange things that could happen if past, present and future somehow got mixed up. I know of no story in which this idea has been better handled than Barclay Square. And we're very happy to have as our star in it tonight, that very fine actor, David Niven. But before we begin, here's Frank Goss with a word about Hallmark. There are Hallmark cards for every memorable occasion on your calendar. For birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. Yes, for every occasion that calls for remembrance, for a friendly greeting, a word of good cheer, an expression of sympathy. There is a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And that identifying hallmark on the back, that says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting John Balderston's Barclay Square and starring David Niven. My name is Peter Standish. I am an American, but for many years my home has been Barclay Square, London. I want to set down in this journal the whole incredible adventure, just as it happened to me. Some time ago, I stood in this very room talking to the American ambassador. The date I shall never forget, it was October 23rd. Well, Peter, you you really liked London. I wouldn't live anywhere else in the world, sir. Well, you were certainly fortunate to inherit a house like this. Yes, I am. I've hardly been out of the house for weeks. I've been going over old papers and documents. An ancestor of mine built this house in 1730. See that picture there above the fireplace? His father. Look at it. <laughs> I say, it is an amazing likeness, isn't it? You might have sat for that portrait yourself. I know. Curious, isn't it? His name was Peter Standish, too. What is this thing? It's the Crooks and Sata. That's the Egyptian symbol of life. What's it doing here? I don't know. It came with the house. Well, it's a <clears throat> charming house. Yes, isn't it? I've been going through a lot of old letters and papers I found upstairs. Even the first Peter Standish's diary. Can you imagine how exciting it would be to change places with him? Walk the quiet streets of London in the 18th century? I'm afraid I'm a bit of a realist, Standish. But, sir, perhaps it's not impossible. Suppose you're in a boat sailing down a winding stream. A mile back, you went by a grove of maple trees, but you can't see them now. So you saw them in the past, didn't you? Well, You're watching a field of clover now, so, of course, that's the present. Now, just ahead of you, there's a bend in the stream. There may be wonderful things up there, but you can't see them until you get around the bend, around the bend, and into the future. Now, remember, you're in the boat. But suppose I'm up above you in a plane, looking down on it all. I can see all at once. The past, the present, and the future. Doesn't that show that all time must really be one? Real time is nothing but an idea in the mind of God. (laughs) You know, Standish, you seem to be obsessed with this idea about time. Perhaps you ought to get away from this house for a few weeks and take a holiday someplace. According to Peter Standish's diary, he was in love with the future just as I am with the past. He wanted to see ahead... Now, if we could change places for a time, of course, I couldn't change anything that actually happened to Peter Standish. I'd have to do exactly what he did. Oh, but it's a fantastic notion. Here's his diary. I know every word of it. Almost 200 years ago, 
Peter Standish took a trip from New York to England. The trip took 27 days in a ship called the General Wolfe. He then married the eldest Pettigrew girl, Kate, in this very house. The betrothal was arranged before they met. They had children who died here. And there was a younger sister, Helen. And look here. There's even something about a cashmere shawl that Helen's aunt in the country centre just before Peter came over. Mm. I have minute details about everything, even the letter Pete, Peter wrote to Lady Anne, the girl's mother, telling them that he would arrive at Berkeley Square on October the 23rd, 1784. October the 23rd? Well, that's today. Yes. And the paper's yellow. The ink faded. But back in that other time, Lady Anne is just reading that letter now. Listen, it was raining then, too. Standish, I, uh, I'm rather late for an appointment. Uh, uh, why don't we have dinner some night soon? If hmm? I can. Good afternoon, sir. It was nice of you to drop by. And remember, Standish, what I said about a holiday. At last, I was alone in the room. The firelight flickered on the ceiling and touched the face in the portrait to a warm, living glow. The past was alive in that room, and I knew it. There was a sudden crack of thunder, and the lights went out, and for a moment, I thought I heard a coach on cobblestones, and then <laughs> I felt a little foolish. Cobblestones, why, they'd had wood blocks for ages in Berkeley Square. But the sound came louder. It came closer through the storm. A coach had stopped in front of the house. In a second, I heard the knocker. I went slowly to the front door. There was no one there. I turned from the door, closing it behind me, and as I turned... My hand touched my sleeve and touched satin. And then, coming down the staircase, I saw a woman in hooped skirts carrying a lighted candelabra. Good evening, Cousin Peter. I thought I heard someone at the door. Oh, forgive me, you are my cousin Peter Standish, newly arrived from America, are you not? I looked down. I was dressed in the clothes of the 18th century. I stared at the woman, my heart pounding. The change had been made. Peter Standish and I had changed centuries. We had your note that you'd arrived in London, cousin. I'm Kate, sir. Pray come into the library. My mother and my sister and my brother are all anxious to bid you welcome. Kate, is it Mr. Standish? Yes, mother. Well, well, cousin Peter, what a delight to see you at last. Kate has been all of a flutter about it for weeks. This is my other daughter, Helen. How do you do, Cousin Peter? Cousin Helen. And this is your cousin, Tom. I'm glad to see you, sir. Pleasure. We're so happy, cousin, that you arrived in time for Helen's birthday ball. Of course. Helen's birthday. Helen, did you like the cashmere shawl your aunt sent you? Cashmere shawl? Is there a shawl in that parcel? I haven't opened it yet. Well, aren't you clever? It is a shawl. My sister wrote me about it. How could you possibly know that, cousin? Well, I... I didn't really. It was only a guess. I, I, I have rather a tiresome headache. I suppose it was the trip. Oh, well, come then. We'll show you to your room. Dinner will be ready very soon. Come. Oh, Helen. Pardon the intrusion, Peter. Mother thought I should ask you if you would like a compress for your hair. No, it's better, thank you. We hope you'll be happy in London. Oh, I'm very excited about it. I was just standing at the window looking out and thinking about it. Somewhere across town, Boswell is listening at Dr. Johnson's elbow. Sheridan is writing The School for Scandal. The what? <laughs> it's a play. Haven't you read about it? No, I haven't. Cousin Peter, how did you know about my shawl? Oh, please don't ask me any more about the confounded thing. If you wish. You'll help me out here, won't you, Helen? How can I help you, Carl? It's all so strange, England, London. I feel like a fish out of water. Is there anything strange or wrong about me? Strange or wrong? I am an American, you know, and this is a, a new world to me. No, of course not. You'll soon get used to our ways, cousin. And Kate will soon put you at your ease. 
I do hope you and my sister will be very happy. I'll see you at dinner, cousin. Helen? Yes, Peter? You're okay. Okay? <laughs> That's just a New York expression. Good evening, Helen. Good evening, cousin Peter. And so I, Peter Standish of the 20th century, entered the parlors, the taverns, the museums, the studios of the 18th century. Helen was at my side constantly, but after the first few days, Kate seemed to avoid me whenever possible, even at Helen's birthday ball. Kate, wasn't this to be my dance? Yes, but I have a headache. I don't feel quite up to dancing just now. Well, then, let's go outside on the balcony for a breath of air. Well, I... I really shouldn't. I... I wanted to see Mother a moment. I... Just for a moment, Kate. Go. Let's go out here. Kate, what's the matter? You've been avoiding me all evening. Have I? Well, you certainly have not been avoiding my sister. But don't tell me you're jealous. You don't... Need to be, you know. No. I'm far from jealous of you, Peter Standish. You're not letting gossip upset you. I know what people are saying about me, and it's ridiculous. Yes. You know what people are saying. And you know what I'm thinking now. You always know. You know what is going to happen next. No, Kate, no. Not in the way you think. And I thought I loved you. Oh, you mustn't talk like that. Why, my dear, we're going to be Married? Married? Do you think I'd marry you and I must force myself to remain alone with you? Everyone sees it but Helen. There's something that... that's not human about you. Kate, you can't bra break our engagement. You didn't do that. You can't do that. Oh, I can't do that. So you think there are no limits to what a wizard can do with a woman? I was never so afraid of anything in my life as I am of you. And you think you can make me marry you? When I fear you as I fear the devil... I leave London in the morning and I'll not return while you're in this house. In heaven's name, go back to America if that's where you come from. Peter. Peter, come and dance with me. You're not afraid of me, Helen. You're not afraid to dance with me. How can you be afraid of someone you feel about the way I feel about you? Of course I want to dance with you, Peter. Oh, Helen. Helen! In a moment, James Hilton will return to present the second act of Barclay Square, starring David Niven. But first, put your head back and try to picture this scene. In a great house in 18th century London, a man is sitting in his library, writing a letter under the light of a silver candelabra. He is writing to his son, one of the letters for which he will be remembered centuries later. Lord Chesterfield has just finished this lasting piece of advice. Words are the dress of thoughts. They should no more be presented in rags and tatters than your person should. Just think about that for a moment. The words and thoughts you send to a friend should reflect your own good taste and personality as surely as the clothes you wear. That's why so many people choose the cards they send so very carefully. Why they choose Hallmark cards. For no matter whether you're sending a gay message of congratulations, a quiet word of sympathy, or for any other occasion, you'll find a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And what is true of the sentiment expressed in a Hallmark card is just as true of everything else about it. The way it's designed, the materials it's made of, the way it's put together. So when you choose a card to express just you to a friend, remember to look for the Hallmark on the back. That tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. <laughs> Now we present Act Two of John Baldiston's Barclay Square, starring David Niven. Long 
after the ball, I paced back and forth in the library, trying to think what to do about Kate. She had to marry Peter Standish. It had happened. Nothing could be changed that had happened in the past. Peter, it's very late. Oh, Helen. I heard you walking up and down. Sounds carry so in this house. You must get some sleep. I can't sleep. You're worried about Kate, aren't you? Well, don't be. I'm sure she'll feel differently when she returns. Peter, tell me how you can know things you couldn't know. Helen, I don't know if I can make you understand. Well, can you see ahead just a day or two or, or months and years? Many months and many years. I love life so. I want to see ahead. I want to know about the future. So you're in love with the future, just as I was in love with the... Oh, it's better just to dream about what's ahead than really to know. No, no. Tell me, please tell me about the future. I couldn't. There aren't any words to make you understand. You say there aren't any words because these things must, must come to your mind in visions, Peter. But I think I could see them, too, through your eyes. Oh, look at me, Peter. Look at me. All right, Helen. If you want to see the future. If you want to see the future. If you want to see the future. Yes, it's exciting and it's terrifying. But it's a challenge, it's adventure, it's progress. Oh, if I could only make you see some of the things I've seen. I'll talk to Kate. I'll tell her I've shared your vision and that she has nothing to fear from you. Helen, I'm not in love with Kate. Oh, Peter, I've loved you before I ever saw you. In my first dream of you, and coming from somewhere far away to meet me. Oh, Helen. Helen, I can't play a part anymore. I'm myself, you see. I'm myself. And I'm muddling everything up. This isn't possible. I come to you from somewhere else. Oh, Peter, take me away with you. Take me back wherever you came from. Helen, I can't. I can't. You see, I come from that world you saw in my eyes. The future? Yes. I believe you. It's incredible, but I believe you. Peter, oh, Peter, you won't go back. You won't leave me. No, never. I'll never leave. Well, Miss Kate, so you've come back from Budley. Well, let me tell you something. Your Mr. Standish has asked for Helen's hand in marriage. What do you think of that? Mother, I'd rather see Helen dead than the wife of Peter Standish. Hush! Not another word like that, miss. Be still, Kate. You can be heard all over the house. Tom, do you want to see your sister eternally damned? Now, now, there's no need for hysteria, Kate. Oh, Kate, I'm glad to see you home again. Kate, dear. Mr. Standish, when you came into this house, did you come from America? Kate, you're being very rude. Go to your room at once. I'll not go until I've had my answer. Your answer is, yes, I do come from America. Mr. Standish. I made a list of ten of the phrases you said were common in New York. On my way home, I stopped to see the American minister. He had never heard of one of the ten. So you see, those words are not used in America. They are not used in England. The devils use them in hell. Kate. Peter Standish came from New York in the General Wolf. His body stands there. But what have you done with him? Kate, have you taken complete leave of your senses? Pray forgive her, Cousin Peter. In the old days, he'd have been... Oh, Cousin... ...at the stake. We'll ballot her somehow, Cousin Peter. I'll drag her upstairs, ma'am. No. You, Kate, you may be a fool, but you're trying in your own silly way to help Helen now, and I love you for... for you, Lady Anne. I've seen you in Sheridan's plays. I've read you in Jane Austen's novels. You know what you want, and you plow straight ahead over everything and through everything, like a tank lumbering through the mud. Do you hear that, Kate? Like a tank. Go to the American legation and ask Charles Francis Adams what tank means. No, it's not Charles Francis Adams. It's John Adams, second president of the United States. 
Charles Adams won't be born until the Civil War in 1861. Peter, Oh, what's one more blunder among so many? Your Peter Standish came from New York to Plymouth in the General Wolfe. This Peter Standish flew from New York to Plymouth. You fiend from hell. What do I care about you? You're all over and done with. You're all dead. You've all rotted in your graves. You're all ghosts. That's what you are. You're all ghosts. Come, Kate. Come, Tom. Helen, come quickly. We'll call a physician. He's out of his... I'll get the doctor. I... I thought I was in love with the past. My dear. My dear. Oh, Helen. I knew eventually it must happen. Each night I've said he must go back. Each morning we'd make some new plan together, and I think, well, let me have just one more day. No. No, I'm going to stay here with you. Oh, Peter, my life, my London are nightmares to you. Don't be sad. Think. We two alone are being chosen for this miracle out of all the millions of lovers since time began. And it is a miracle. Think of what has been given us. Not of what is taken away. Nothing can be taken away. That we came together as we did proves that we were not meant to lose each other. Yes, yes. And we shall be together always, Peter. Not in my time, nor in yours, but in God. If I go, then he will be here in my place, in my body. How can you bear that? Love will give me strength. You have your life to live out in the future, Peter. And in my life, as I grow old, your youth will seem to me eternal youth. For you will come, won't you, young as I see you now, to my grave in St. Mark's churchyard. To you, that will be tomorrow. And yet it will be generations after I'm dead. I'll ask for a stone with the letters cut deep so they won't wear away before you come to me. Oh, darling, darling, I love you now. I shall love you in my time and in whatever times may come. Oh, if you could only take back with you just one thing that was mine. Oh, wait, here's something Father got for me before he died when he was with the fleet in Egypt. The Crux and Sata. What is it? The symbol of life of eternity. And that's why I've loved it so. Helen, this was mine long ago. Yours long ago. It was standing over there when I first entered this room in, in the future. A little thing has crossed the great darkness between us. Mine, yours, and that world I shall never see. This is our parting, Peter. Helen. Oh, Helen, my darling. Goodbye, Peter. <laughs> She picked up the candelabra and walked out of the library with it. The room was in darkness. My hand brushed my sleeve and touched something rough. The lights blazed on. I looked down. I was dressed in tweeds again. It was at an end. And I, Peter Standish, was back in the 20th century. I left the house then and walked to St. Mark's churchyard. I knelt beside the stone with the letters cut deep as she had promised. I knelt and read, Here lies in the competent hope of the blessed resurrection and life eternal, Helen Pettigrew, beloved younger daughter of Sir William Pettigrew and the Lady Anne Pettigrew, who departed this life June the 15th, 1780, aged 23 years. to Berkeley Square to write the whole incredible adventure down on the pages of this journal. There only remains to write these lines. Helen, my dear, 
I've seen your shadow on the stairs. I've seen your hand rest on this desk. I've seen you sitting by that window, and you'll always be close to me in this house. You'll always be the living, beautiful soul of this house. And I know that we shall be together, not in your time, not in mine, but in God's. In a moment, James Hilton and David Niven will return. Meantime, I'm afraid that while I've been telling you about all the many Hallmark cards for special occasions, I may have neglected to remind you about the wonderful Hallmark dolls. Hallmark dolls don't require any special occasion to make a child's eyes light up with joy. For these happy little dolls can be a coming home gift from a daddy who's been away, their grand favors for a party, or just something extra for being real good. And there are so many to choose from. Right now, there are 24 of these feather-topped Hallmark dolls, eight dolls of the nations, and 16 dolls from the land of make-believe. There's little Miss Muffet, and there's Rita from Brazil. There's little boy Blue and cowboy Joe. 24 of these lovable little personalities. Each stands up by itself. Each has a clever rhyme story telling about it, and to make taking good care of them very easy, there are the doll collector's albums with a place for each doll. The Hallmark dolls that can be mailed just like a greeting card cost only 25 cents each, and the albums are only 50 cents each. So, for the favorite little person on your list, visit the friendly store where you buy your Hallmark cards and ask to see the whole collection of Hallmark dolls. Here again is James Hilton. Tonight we've heard a story that's a fine example of imaginative writing, the kind of story that requires superlative skill on the part of the actors, and that's exactly what we've had. Mr. Niven, we thoroughly enjoyed your performance. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. And thanks also to Lorene Tuttle and Francis Robinson for their beautiful portrayals of Helen and Kate. It is quite a long bridge between 1784 and the present day, but even if the customs, the clothes, and the speech have changed, people are pretty much the same. They cry and laugh pretty much at the same kinds of things. They have the same emotions, react to humor, love, sympathy. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hilton, all the things which those fine hallmark greeting cards of yours express. Mr. Hilton, I'm so glad to have been invited to the Playhouse this evening. And it was our pleasure to have you here. And now I'd like to tell you what we've planned for next Thursday. We shall present then a dramatized version of Meredith Wilson's book which tells the story of his early life. A story with the fascinating title, And There I Stood With My Piccolo, and starring Meredith Wilson himself. And the following week on St. Patrick's Day, we shall appropriately present Edward McSorley's Irish-American story, Our Own Kind, starring Barry Fitzgerald. And the week after that, Arthur Pinero's great love story, Enchanted Cottage, starring Richard Conte. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our director-producer is Dee Engelbach. Our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. And our script tonight was adapted by Gene Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you care enough to send the very best. David Niven appears to the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn and may currently be seen in the motion picture Enchantment. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all and inviting you next Thursday and every Thursday to tune in a half hour earlier and listen to The Adventures of Casey, Crime Photographer, followed by the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.